Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the closing plenary of this two days event. My name is Nadia Gullestrup Christensen. And I'm Kim Mohtanen. In this closing plenary, we will be discussing the million dollar question. How the circular economy can help and halt and reverse biodiversity loss of global scale. We will be focusing on the subject matter in the context of coming Montreal global framework and the EU's work of circularity. But first of all, Nadia, you were in Montreal at the end of last year, so what were the main messages that you took home from you, with you? So Montreal was really buzzing with nature-positive people, and that was really motivating. And Montreal managed to decide that we should protect 30% of areas on land and sea, and that was really incredible that we managed to get such an ambitious agreement. That being said, a lot of focus was on these overall goals, and I therefore also see this World Circular Economy Forum as a really great follow-up to that, as I've seen and heard so many concrete, tangible solutions here at this forum. Fantastic. And we'll continue with those themes. And obviously, we've had a fantastic two days forum. At this stage, let's give a round of applause so for all our participants and speakers who've made this event happen. Um, uh, during the two days, we've had so many plenaries, encounters, meetings amongst people. And actually, we've had our pearl hunters working from morning till noon. And by pearl hunters, we mean keynote observation people. They're observing, watching us as we're having these discussions and collecting these pearls, i.e. important messages. And now we have actually quite a few messages for you to hear from our pearl hunters. So shall we get going? Yes, and one of the first pearls was the importance of circular economy is understood increasingly well, and that was one of the messages. That said, discussions on circularity focuses too much on the future, and the pearl hunters, they found that there needs to be much more focuses on what is happening at the moment, and also focus on taking more action. And obviously, businesses have been at the center of everything, and we already learned from the day one that they are pivotal in this transition. And the pearl goes, businesses can really make the change happen. Companies need, to, need circular skills, but it's also important to provide them with a regulatory and taxation framework that promotes the circular transition. We not only tax the linear economy too little, but we also subsidize it currently. And another pearl is that metrics move markets and really matters. And with that being said, it's also focusing on the fact that we need a price tag on nature, as currently the prices do not capture the true cost of a lot of different things. This morning, in our first plenary, we talked about how money talks. And the next one goes, as we all know, money talks. But how do we get money to listen? We need more capacity building and new financial instruments such as de-risking activities for early stage companies and small and middle-sized entrepreneurs to further promo promote circular investments. We also need working capital to accelerate already existing solutions. And another one goes, which is really an, an inspiring and concrete things, because it also shows that collaboration and new partnerships has really been fostered here. And that is, at the event, multilateral development banks stepped up to promote investments in circular solutions. And the European Investment Bank, the African Development Bank, the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, and the Inter-American Development Bank, and last but not least, the World Bank, decided to collaborate on key challenges for the financial sector, really showing the power of collaboration. Obviously, we know, all know the challenges are great, but so are the opportunities. And we also know that uh, phenomenon like uh, biodiversity loss, climate change, pollution of the seas, they are all intertwined, and so are the solutions. So, and the pearl goes, we believe that biodiversity loss will be as big an issue as climate change is today within the next five years. Changing our relationship with nature is ultimately not only about environmental, but also economic equality, security and resilience imperative. When integrating climate and social aspects, circular solutions are usually less risky than linear solutions. 
And last but not least, uh, the pearl in the end really circulates how we can enable all of the other pearls to, to happen, and that is to ensure a just transition, we must include intergenerational and marginalized voices and build meaningful participation. We must have the courage to ask uncomfortable questions while young people have the visions and imagination to shake the existing reality. Here, here. <laughs> And thank you to our pearl hunters who've been working hard from morning till noon for the last two days and collecting those important messages for us all to share. All right, are you guys ready for our last plenary of this year's forum? Are you ready? Yes. How ready are you? How ready are you? Yeah. Hey, that's no. okay. We can do better. We'll, we'll test that later. Well, it's time to get the show going. Uh, first, we are delighted to receive greetings from Dublin Circular economy hotspot. They, t they also be celebrating circularity for the last four days. And please welcome on stage via video link, uh, Ossian Smith, Minister of State of Ireland. Please welcome. So we're here in Croke Park, our national stadium, as part of Circular Economy Hotspot, joining you in the World Circular Economy Forum. And I'm joined today by Minister Ossian Smith, Minister of State with responsibility for the circular economy. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Sarah. Great to be here. What policy developments have we seen over the last few years that is uh, really making uh, Ireland wake up to the circular economy? Well, the major landmark was last summer. We passed a new law called the Circular Economy Act, uh, and that uh, had important elements. One of them was that we had to make a circular economy strategy regularly for the whole of government, not just for the Department of Environment, to make sure that the whole of government was coming up with its tasks and plans for how to transform the economy to a circular economy and that they would legally have to do that. So that was the first thing. And in relation to the immediate benefits that you're seeing from these policies, what exactly is happening on the ground here in Ireland? Well, I think when we began to communicate about the circular economy to the public, it was a brand new concept for, for the Irish public and it was very well received. And I think part of that was the timing. So we had, we'd gone through the pandemic and it was difficult to get goods from far away. Then we went into the war and again, difficult with energy prices, difficult with supply chains. So what the circular economy was saying was that our country could be more self-sufficient, that if we could use uh, and produce things locally, if we could reuse things, if we could fix things, that we'd actually have a, a stronger local economy that was more resilient to those type of external shocks. So really it's been very well received generally by the public. Where do you see the most activity happening right here at the moment? I see a lot of trend towards renovation and fixing and repair. So I see a, a, people getting that idea that, uh, that goods are, should not just be thrown away and replaced with the, the latest and greatest, and that there is a chance to, um, to take something that you, you, you own for a while and that you're attached to, and to, to have, it, have it upcycled, repaired, renovated. Uh, and I, I can see a trend for that going, going across society. So what's next uh, for circular economy development in Ireland? Well, we have a new uh, version of the circular economy strategy is coming out soon, and that will have specific sectoral targets in it. It will have more, more detailed actions. They will be allocated across all of government, and they will have the, um, the approval of central government. So that, that, that's really going to lay out a kind of a roadmap for what, what has to happen in circular economy. So you talked earlier about investment in the circular economy. Are there specific funds for the circular economy? We are setting up a, a circular economy fund, and that, is, that has been laid down in the law that we passed last year, and that will be funded with levies from different activities that are bad for the environment. But in addition to this, we've also been running something called the Circular Economy Innovation Grant Scheme. And what that is, is a competitive fund where you can apply, if you have an idea for your business or your social enterprise, you can apply for approximately 50,000 euros just to, to carry out your idea that will help your organisation move to a circular economy. So you recently travelled to Finland. Could you tell us a little bit about your visit and what you got to see there or what lessons you took back? Yeah, I was in Finland in January and the reason we went there is because Finland has a reputation for being further down the journey towards a circular economy than, than other countries. And what I, I noticed is that it, circular economy had become very normalised there. It wasn't a sort of innovative idea anymore. It was something that everybody bought into, part of people's daily life. So the circular economy is being seen as a great opportunity to halt biodiversity loss. 
Is that something that has been recognised here in national policy or practice? There's a big push in the bioeconomy sector in Ireland. Ar Ireland obviously a very agricultural economy and there is a natural tendency for farmers to, to act in a circular way, uh, to reuse things, to be efficient, you know, to, to create their own compost and so on. And I think there's a large overlap between bioeconomy and circular economy. We have our food waste uh, reduction strategy, which links in with the European food waste reduction strategy. And I think that in general, those actions that move away from pesticides and artificial fertilizers will all be things that will uh, help um, promote biodiversity. So the circular economy hotspot is happening in Dublin at the moment. In terms of the development of the circular economy in Ireland and internationally, what role do you think the hotspot has to play? I think the hotspot brings policymakers together with practitioners, with academics, with people from government. And I think it's really important to have somewhere where everybody can share those ideas. Uh, otherwise, we risk having people who are separated from each other and not learning from each other's experience. And it's also important to get the international dimension because some countries are further along the route than others. So it's great to be able to share the experiences of what's working, what isn't working when people come together, when they work together and they share that human enthusiasm together, I think that special things can happen and that we can move forward. Thank you, Ossian Smith, Minister of State of Ireland. Next, we are pleased to have Elizabeth Embra, Deputy Executive Director of UN Environment Programme, joining us through a pre-recorded video link. Greetings to you all. Thank you for the invitation to address this forum on the need to transition to a circular economy. I would like to thank the co-host of the World Circular Economy Forum, the Finnish Innovation Fund, CITRA, and Nordic Innovation. CITRA's report tackling root causes, halting biodiversity loss through the circular economy, highlighted nature's vital role in our societies and economies. But we know that we have not been respectful of nature. The way we currently produce, consume, and dispose of waste is driving triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution and waste. Nature is declining faster than at any other time in human history. The alarming bells are ringing. One million species of plants and animals are threatened with extinction. Half of our forests gone in less than half a century and so much more destruction underway as we speak. But the nature crisis does not only threaten the environment, it also affects how we live, we work and prosper. ILO estimates that 1.2 billion jobs rely on effective management and sustainability of ecosystems. Biodiversity loss is already costing the global economy 10% of its output every year. We cannot afford inaction, but we have made important strides in tackling the biodiversity crisis. In December last year, in Montreal, parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity adopted the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, providing a blueprint to safeguard and sustainably use biodiversity. We set ambitious global targets to achieve by 2030, including a commitment to, pro to reduce the global footprint of consumption in an equitable manner. The framework also calls for mainstreaming uh, nature across society, including key sectors for biodiversity recovery, such as agriculture, fisheries, and forestry. Secularity is an essential part of the transformation we need. It supports a systems approach that lessens the impact of these sectors on nature while nurturing its regenerative potential. For example, secular food models support healthy soils and reduce pressure to expand agricultural land. They have the potential to cut emissions by 49% of 5.6 billion tons of carbon dioxide, almost halving emissions from this sector by 2050. One area in particular demonstrates how secularity can tackle a global challenge, plastic pollution. No corner of our planet or species is left untouched by this crisis. As exchanges are concluding here at the World Circular Economy Forum, 
Discussions continue in Paris at the second session of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee to develop an internationally legally binding instrument on plastic pollution. This process offers the opportunity to bring circularity across the plastic value chain. We must put our weight behind this process and in so doing, we can do our part to speed up the transition to a circular economy. Thank you. Thank you so much to Deputy Executive Director Elizabeth Mamma for those inspirational words. I will now like to give the floor to Catherine Stewart, who is the Ambassador for Climate Change in Canada. Let's give her a round of applause while she joins us on stage. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to be here on behalf of the Government of Canada. We are facing a triple planetary crisis, climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. And the urgency of tackling these crises has never been greater. And one of the most critical assets that we have is nature. Unsustainable global consumption and production are driving biodiversity loss, which threatens not only nature, but also people, our health, our economies, and our societies. We can't continue with business as usual. There is a growing consensus that a shift to circularity is both the critical next wave for climate change and a key to creating space for biodiversity to recover and flourish. The circular economy recognizes that our economies are embedded within nature, not external to it. So our economies need to respect, respect nature's limits. This is the reason, one of the key reasons, why Canada hosted governments from around the world at COP15 in December of 2022. In Montreal, Canada, and the other 195 nations to the Conve UN Convention for Biological Diversity, reached a historic agreement to safeguard, to safeguard the world's nature, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. The Global Biodiversity Framework aims to halt and reverse biodiversity loss by 2030, and to put nature on a path to recovery by 2050. This is a very big milestone. And with the adoption of the Global Biodiversity Framework, Canada and others will be working to update our national biodiversity strategies by COP16 in 2024. Because transformative change is needed to address the harms to nature and the climate brought on by linear economy and the unsustainable production and consumption. So to help lead the world's collective efforts towards transformative change, Canada has started to develop a comprehensive, updated national biodiversity strategy and action plan to 2030. And we're doing this in collaboration with provinces, territories, indigenous representatives, and key stakeholders. We recognize the need for bold collaboration and partnership, including with indigenous peoples who are the guardians of the land. So over the years, we have seen how the circular economy can unify actors across regions, sectors, and interest groups by providing a framework to respond to the climate, nature, and pollution crises simultaneously, while also providing new economic opportunities. I saw the unifying power of circularity when Canada brought the World Circular Economy Forum to North America in 2021, with nearly 9,000 registrants from 160 countries. The forum in 2021 demonstrated the far-reaching benefits of circularity, from supporting indigenous economies, to ensuring supply of critical natural resources, to accelerating our net zero journey. A diverse group of new allies joined the call for ambitious action and leadership to advance circular, the circular economy in North America and beyond, with particularly inspiring contributions from youth. 
Since then, we've seen growing momentum toward a circular economy transition in Canada with new grassroots community partnerships to collaborations with Indigenous peoples, to industry coalitions, all recognizing the opportunities of circular economy transition and raising the level of ambition. So in Canada, we banned the manufacture, import, and sale of six single-use plastics, and we will set minimum recycled content thresholds for plastic, plastic products. We're taking action to keep valuable resources in the economy and out of the environment, and implementing a right of repair, starting with the framework for home appliances and electronics. We're investing in innovative solutions to reduce food waste, to recover valuable metals from, from mining waste, and to create a circular forest bioeconomy, with, all with nature in mind. So governments really need to lead by example, which is why we are adopting a green procurement strategy and transitioning to net zero carbon and climate resilient operations, while also reducing impacts from government activities on waste, water, and biodiversity. As governments around the world work towards global commitments to conserve nature and reduce GHG emissions, we can leverage circularity both to accelerate this project process, progress and to pre prevent the further locking in of nuclear production, linear production patterns, and creating vast amounts of waste. The adoption of circular economy practices can also harness the role of the private sector in driving innovation and financial resources towards halting and reversing biodiversity loss. But we need to listen to and include those who are most affected by the way we manage resources in our economy, including youth, indigenous peoples, and climate vulnerable communities. We must prioritize affordability and quality of life to avoid reinforcing the inequalities of the current linear economy. Our actions must account for the unique geographic, economic, and cultural circumstances of diverse communities and ensure that everyone can take part in the opportunities presented by circular economy transition. So by bringing these conversations to Asia, North America, and most recently to Africa, the World Circular Economy Forum has demonstrated that there is no right way to be circular. If we continue breaking down those silos to share what we know, develop a common language, and build momentum through events like the World Circular Economy Forum, we will be closer to achieving a future where our society and nature can thrive together. A future that is healthier, more equitable, and more sustainable today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Catherine Stewart, for those really motivational words. Um, and now it is time for the keynote speech of the closing plenary. And this uh, will be EU Commissioner Virginia Sinkevicius, who will address how the EU can continue developing the EU Green Deal and how we can ensure that circularity plays a key role in the Green Deal 2.0. Let's give him a hand of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for closing this conference with a focus on the European Green Deal. The deal charted a new direction for the EU, a new determination to take a systemic approach based on the interplay between our people, our economy and our planet. And today the deal is already delivering in the EU and beyond. It's given us clear roadmaps to climate neutrality, to a nature-positive circular economy, to a world of zero pollution and to a model that decouples growth from our use of resources. It also brought a strong international focus. The circular economy is gaining global traction through GASIER and through the regional alliances we continue to support. If it's taken us this far, that's largely thanks to its innovative approach. It's an approach 
that brings people and policies together. We need that unity because the crises we are facing are so closely interlinked. We can't tackle climate change if we don't restore nature. We can't stop biodiversity loss if we don't stop pollution. And of course, we won't solve any of these problems until we change our approach to production and consumption. The Green Deal takes all these elements on board, proposing a path that addresses environmental problems with solutions that are socially inclusive. With the European climate law and the Fit for 55 package, we have measures to ensure climate neutrality by 2050. With the EU biodiversity strategy and the Coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework adopted at COP15, we have the nature targets we need. And with the new Commission strategy for long-term competitiveness and the Green Deal industry plan, we can build a better union, a home for clean tech and green jobs. To deliver these things, we need one more ingredient. We must fully implement the principles of the circular economy. That takes us to a future where resource constraints and planetary boundaries are systematically respected. It's the path of our action plan for the circular economy. And I am determined to deliver this plan to the full. Deliver it with actions that reduce our consumption footprint, our dependence on natural resources and our over-reliance on important materials and energy. Deliver it with measures for every step of a product's life cycle targeting the areas that count and generating new opportunities for business. One good example of that is the proposal for the Eco-Design for Sustainable Products Regulation. Up to 80% of a product's impact is decided by design, by targeting that phase and extending the legislation to a wide range of products. will push a vast range of products towards greater circularity. This final session looks to the future. It's never easy to predict the exact direction policies will take, but our recent past and the crisis we have faced together bear important clues. Our united response to the recovery from the pandemic, to Russia's illegal, unprovoked and unjustified war against Ukraine, and to the energy crisis showed that our values and goals hold strong. Our response showed that even in the face of great challenges, our determination to pursue the green and digital transition is not to be reversed. Thanks to our European Green Deal, we have a very clear map on our path to a sustainable, prosperous future. And in uncertain times, a good map is the start that we need. Thank you. Thank you very much, you Commissioner Virginius Sinkevicius. Now it's time to move on to discuss the main themes of uh, Commissioner Sinkevicius's uh, speeches. It's time to meet our panelists. President of CITRA, Jyrki Katainen, was the European Commission Vice President for Jobs, Growth, Investment and Competitiveness. And prior to role in the Commission, he held the position of Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of Finland. Welcome, Jyrki Katainen. And I would then like to welcome Vivian Heinen, who is Minister for the Environment of the Netherlands. Minister Heinen has been a member of the Maastricht Municipal Executive with responsibility for the economy, housing, regional policy and social innovation. Welcome to the floor, Minister Vivian Heinen. Thank you. Okay. Hello, good to see you again. Carmen N is the CEO of Three Step It, a Finnish company that offers circular technology services to businesses by helping them access, manage and give a second life to their corporate devices. Carmen is also the CEO of BNP Paribas, Three Step It, a joint venture between Three Step It and BNP Paribas. She oversaw the establishment of in 2019. Before joining Three Step It, Carmen spent several years at IBM covering different roles acro across Europe, include, including Vice President of the company's Enterprise Global Businesses. Welcome, Carmen Ene. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Lovely. And last but not least, we would also like to welcome Astrid Schumacher, who is Director for Green Diplomacy and Multilateralism in the European Commission's Director of General for Environment. She has been leading the work on chemical policy, marine issues, and the EU's environment policy strategy to 2030. Welcome, Astrid Schumacher. 
great to have you with us. Um, so we get down to the business <laughs> straight away. Um, Commissioner Sinkevicius said in that um, in his speech that the Green Deal is already delivering its core meanings in the EU and beyond. And now we would like to hear from you that um, um, has the European Green Deal succeeded in strengthening a transition to a circular economy? And let's do it in the way that uh, we first get a yes or no answer from all of you and then we will elaborate on your answers with a bit of a dialogue. So um, shall we start with Jurgi here? Yes. 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 <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Oh, he's yes, my boss, he's my boss, you know, I have to. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a unanimous <laughs> panel here with the first question. Lovely, and, and Jyrki Katainen, can, can you maybe elaborate a bit on why you said yes to the question? Yes, certainly, because um, Green Deal has been extensive policy program gathering together different policy areas. It, it's not, it has not been only a environmental exercise, but it has collected together all different parts of the economy, which is very important in order to get uh, things done. And that is the reason why Citra also published a couple of days ago a um, position paper or discussion paper on the future of a Green Deal. Its name is putting nature at the heart of the European Green Deal. So if anybody is interested in this paper, you can download it from our website. I, actually, I, I hope you are interested in that because we need more debate on, on the subject. So next year we'll have the EP European Parliamentary elections and the new commission will be uh, chosen or elected. And our view is that the next commission certainly needs a new Green Deal, Green Deal 2.0. So um, we, we need to bring the nature's value uh, to, to visibility. For instance, natural capital, how much our nature is in, in terms of economic values. And also we need to, to understand the role of ecosystem services. So um, good news is that circular economy is very hard in this program because uh, by spreading or using more circular business models we can address in one go both climate and biodiversity issues. So I have already said several times during this, these two days that I believe that the biodiversity loss is going to be as big an issue as climate change is today within the next five years. And we traditionally have been thinking that in order to address biodiversity loss, we have to set up new conservation areas. This is absolutely needed, but uh, it's not enough. If we ever manage to reach the target to protect 30% of our land and water area, which is EU's and UN's target, I'm more interested in the 70%. Because uh, the world is not healthy and our economy cannot survive if only 30% of our globe is healthy. So that's why we have to look at the 70%. And when we start looking at the 70%, there's no other option but to include economy to the core. So we need market-based approach to address biodiversity loss uh, addi additionally to the traditional uh, conservation. So in our discussion paper, we are uh, suggesting to establish a genuine circular single market concept, which means that we mainstream circular materials, products and services through smart regulation. Also, we have to reform common agricultural policy, which is very important um, part of this exercise. So these are my, my initial thoughts that I really want to encourage you to look at the discussion paper. There are also very many open questions uh, to which we hope somebody would like to provide an answer. Great, thank you very much. Yeah. So we carry on with the, with, the, with the round first and then move on to elaborating on Jyrki's speech. So Carmen, would you like to comment on your answer? Oh, my yes. Briefly. Uh, yeah. Yes, because I salute all the initiative and I believe the EU is showing uh, and leading um, the, the way on, on the Green Deal. Uh, I be, I, I, as a company, I salute 
the fact that uh, circular economy is including and the new taxonomy and the new reporting that it's uh, going to come. However, uh, and I know this word has a connotation uh, in English and I use it uh, specifically. Um, I think in terms of uh, circular economy, we are only scratching the surface. Uh, we have heard in the morning a report from the World Bank uh, where they um, uh, make an analysis that only 5% or 10% maximum um, he goes into uh, circular models in Europe and refurbishing is only 1.9%. So a lot to be done. But I also salute uh, the fact that we are looking at data uh, and the European Union will um, really look at the data audit trail to prove the credentials in sustainability because there is a green deal, but there was also a, a lot of greenwash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Vivian, you also said uh, yes, just like all the others. Can can you elaborate a bit on, on why you think it did so? Uh, I did say yes, uh, because I think that the way that Europe dealt with the Green Deal, it's a very integrated approach. It's a holistic approach. It's the first time that really everything has been addressed, climate, biodiversity loss, uh, water, but also resource management. And um, it is so important to look at it from an integral perspective, as you already mentioned. Um, I think that uh, another important thing is that it's important that uh, the idea of sustainability goes further than just looking at environmental policy. And that concept is a true keeper, in my opinion. Thank you so much. Really short and sweet. And I try. I'm a politician, so sometimes I may answer a bit longer. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That was, that was uh, truly excellent. Um, so let's see if Astrid Schumacher can do it, maybe just as well as what uh, Vivian Heinen managed to do. So why did you answer yes to the question? Well, I said absolutely because I work for the European Commission. <laughs> <laughs> Not biased at all. But of, course, all no, but of course, also, because I think in the past five years, we've really seen the tide turn as regards the circular economy. I think with the European Green Deal, we've been very clear that the economic model has to change, but also, and importantly, that what is at the core of the economic model and what is at the core of the triple planetary crisis is our use, or rather our unsustainable use of natural resources. And that that is the point where we have to start if we want to become climate neutral. What we haven't said so much yet, and hopefully we'll say a bit more, and that's then in line with the, um, what the President Katana has just said, is it is also at the core of being nature positive, and that's been quite clear when we when we were in Kunming, when we were in Montreal, and discussed the framework. So that is that is one important aspect. But it's been a success because it's been driven from the top, because it's been made clear that, as you just said, it's not just about environment policy; it's about all sectors coming together. And then, lastly, it's been a bit timid, but it has recognized that there are social issues that come with this transition and that need to be addressed as well. And I think that's also a crucial ingredient. In making it a success. Thank you so much. Um, and we've now asked uh, all four of you to, to prepare a brief speech where you will talk a bit more about uh, what you think is needed uh, to move towards a more resilient and nature positive future, both on EU level and also globally. And I'd like to start giving the floor to Yoki Katainen for, for your three minutes remark. I already gave my speech, but uh, <laughs> I, I can I add a few thoughts. That sense, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I can add some, some thoughts. So, um, classically, we all know what the biodiversity means. We all have been taught this basic issue at school. And nature is important for all of us from, from many angles. And reasons. It's something physical, it, it, it's a um, source of inspiration and stuff like this, but we had never really thought how economic structures or market forces could be incorporated to protect the nature. We have classically learned to think that economy is bad for nature. And there are good examples uh, that it has been very bad, but not because the economy itself is bad, uh, on the, but because we have let the economy to function wrong way. So that's why I yesterday said that, that the market economy, if you look at the concept of market economy, it doesn't have any values. It's only have features. 
And those features are very good if you harness them positively and from nature angle. If you put market machinery to produce more nature, it does it much more efficiently than any other political decision making. So, so that's why I'm so interested in this connection between economy, market forces and biodiversity because we have not really tested this opportunity yet. And we have a necessity to put to, into function different way. Because uh, how, what else we can do in order to, to maintain or, or, or increase biodiversity within this 70% area of, of our land and water area, which is not meant to be protected. So I, I'm, I'm positive by nature, but I, I'm even enthusiastic when thinking what we can, how far we can go with the new way of thinking, incorporating economic thinking to, to, uh, to addressing biodiversity. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, not only you're going to have to give us a three-minute speech during this panel, but you, you can also um, comment on each other's uh, speeches. And we, will, we have picked you randomly, but um, I would ask Ra uh, Astrid to start um, giving us a few thoughts on what did Jyrki's speech, what kind of thoughts did it evoke in you? Well, first of all, of course, I agree. <laughs> so that's <laughs> the easy part. Um, I think what is really important is that we stop thinking that climate is one thing and nature is something else. So in Montreal, that's become very clear, but that's become very clear to the biodiversity community. It's not necessarily clear in the mainstream thinking where people think, okay, we now have to do something to cut our climate ambitions because that's a real problem and nature we can deal with later. And that's something we have to change and also highlight that nature is actually the main solution provider for, for climate change. So that is, I think, one important thing that we need to, to change. The second one, and that's just been said, we still tend to think that nature comes, to f comes for free so that we can just use nature because there's no price for nature, that we can abstract water to our heart's content, etc., etc. So we will see, I think, in the very near future that this cannot go on, so we need to look more seriously at polluter pays, at pricing signal, etc. And maybe, because we're pressed for time as a last thing, just I think very important from the European Union perspective, we tend to be a sort of group of inward-looking, navel-gazing countries, very much concerned with our own well-being, etc. But as we move ahead as a group of countries and as a group of democracies towards greater well-being, our well-being also has impacts beyond our borders. And there we really need to be very careful and I think do a lot more work in terms of seeing our consumption of certain commodities, for example, um, deforestation-related commodities, palm oil, soy, timber, etc. That has an impact on the rest of the world and we need to also be a more responsible actor and see what we actually consume and how we can consume deforestation-free. Great, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Right, we'll continue with Jurki with a follow-up question. Um, can you give us a concrete example on how to enhance and accelerate, accelerate circularity during the next Commission's mandate? One, th there are plenty of things what can be done, um, but I would like to raise one thing which was mentioned and uh, it inspired me. Uh, it's data. Because we need to connect right data for this exercise. Mm -hmm. You said right that there's been green deal, but there's uh, there's al also been green washing. And in order to avoid green washing, we need to get right data in right place. So, uh, commission, this commission has done many good things, but one one of the good things is that it has introduced the concept of digital product passport which means that each product would have a passport which consumer can follow so they could get data from sustainability, performance, uh, raw materials and safety. And the reason for having this passport is that it could promote more sustainable products and methods, create a new market for companies who are producing more and more sustainable products. But before this is possible, we need data and we need digital passport. So this will come already, 2026, to batteries. So this is one of the concrete um, commission or, or EU decisions. But we need more examples, more experimentations and pilot projects. And for this reason, for instance, Citra has launched three pilot uh, projects 
on digital passport. They are in three different fields. The first one is logistics sector, the second one is textile and clothing, and the third one is batteries industry. Mm. Great. Thank, Thank you so you. much. And really interesting with the fact that we need to put more focus on, on data, which might not always be the most interesting thing, but, no. but you can make it sound more interesting. Yeah. Um, I would like to give the floor to uh, Minister Vivian Heinen for, for her three minutes remark. Well, thanks uh, so much. And first of all, let me also uh, thank Citra and the Nordic Innovation for organizing this terrific World Circular Economy Forum uh, here in Finland. And congratulations on the success so far. I think it's been very helpful for me, uh, coming from politics, to be in touch with companies, but also talk to uh, banks, investment banks, uh, about how we can make the transition happen, because it's so important we join forces. Um, and uh, I also would like to thank you for taking the opportunity to allow me in your panel because I'm very passionate when it comes to the circular economy and it's a, a, a policy priority for me. And it has also become a cornerstone uh, for the Netherlands in our environmental policy. And circular economy is a very powerful instrument to address the triple planetary crises that we are dealing with, so climate change, pollution, but also biodiversity loss, which you already mentioned. And uh, you just mentioned that we consume and produce also too much and in a very unsustainable way. Uh, in total, if we continue to use um, uh, the earth uh, and the resources uh, as we do now on a global scale, we need 1.6 globes to continue producing the way we are and consuming. Uh, but if you look at the Western world alone, and or le let's look at the Netherlands, we need about four globes to continue consuming um, uh, as we are doing uh, uh, resource-wise. We only have one globe, so we have to change the system. That's, my, uh, that's been my conclusion. Um, and I do think that we need uh, calculation models to convince everyone, but I also think it's very important to make people aware of this simple fact, because this is a fact. Mm. And uh, we have to move away from the linear economy uh, in order to avert climate change, to avoid pollution, and to also stop and reverse the loss of our biodiversity. So in the Netherlands, I recently published the new national program on circular economy. We are ambitious. We want to be half circular by 2030 and fully circular by 2050. But we also realize that we cannot do it alone because an economy doesn't stop at the national border. Uh, our companies also export. Uh, the Netherlands imports a lot of um, 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 uh, products. So we need Europe uh, to set ambitious standards and goals. I have to say that I'm really uh, positive about the fact that uh, Commissioner Sinkovic has uh, pushed for a very ambitious agenda, so uh, I feel like he's a bit of my ally in that respect. And um, we are also looking at ways to uh, promote product groups, uh, because we cannot do everything ourselves in the Netherlands. Some countries are better in other uh, product groups, so we have to learn from each other. And what we are doing in the Netherlands is focus, for example, on the built environment. It's very important because 38% of all raw materials go, come from, uh, go to the built environment. So if we can really make a circular twist and turn there, then it really makes a big impact on the amount of natural resources that we are using. And I think it's also very important that we learn from each other. I just visited, uh, I quickly went from this site to an example of a building, uh, an office building, which is completely renovated in a circular way. Almost 80% of all uh, construction uh, products are being reused at the site and even more, uh, a higher percentage is being reused uh, for other uh, purposes. So I was really impressed and we can learn from each other. Uh, the Netherlands also has um, ambitious when it comes to building with wood. Uh, Finland has a lot of experience there, but we have to learn from each other uh, and we really need Europe, so I'm looking at you, uh, <laughs> to also uh, set uh, high standards because there is a lot of innovation and power in Europe, uh, but we need uh, to set the standards so that all companies go along. And I think it's also important that after innovations have taken place, we help companies to for the uh, skill up phase yeah. because there is where a lot of companies are struggling. Mm -hmm. I hope that was not a lot longer than two minutes, but probably <laughs> it was. <laughs> no, it's okay. You were no, so good. 
but if I may, I really like your uh, um, discussion about standards and some countries more advanced than the others because as a business, we do business in many countries. Uh, and one of the challenges is that every country has its own rules and regulations. So as soon as we get to the high standards that we all want to be, the better. So. Yeah. Exactly, and, and, and like uh, Carmen was saying, you're you today representing businesses in general, not just your companies. So um, in Vivian's speech, are there any, any other sort of comments that kind of, you were nodding quite a lot to Vivian's speech. I was thinking, what kind of other thoughts did bring your mind that speech? D what did it like in terms of the solutions, like Vivian was talking about the people coming together, we need to learn from one another. From the business point of view, what do you think you could learn when it comes to like governance and, and businesses working together? Well, I mean, I can only say, if you want to comment me, if you want me to comment on this one, um, I, I take again the, the subject of data uh, and the fact that we need clean audit trail for some of the claims uh, are done in terms of sustainability. So a company like mine, and I'll explain after <laughs> in my presentation what we do, uh, a company like mine has a lot of data. Mm. Uh, that we gather 25 years. Uh, a lot of data on the repairability of various brands, uh, the possibility to give them a second life. So companies like mine and others that have this accumulation of data, we would be very happy to work with the legislators and with other, uh, with other uh, companies to put this data into practice and see how we can valorize it um, to, to be able to measure these difficult things that circular economy pose because one of the things is how do you measure the avoidance of creating new stuff and, and these are difficult things to measure but there is that data around uh, that we will be very happy to to work with yeah like Nadia said we need to make data media sexy that is going to be the new black mm -hmm. yeah. and we're going to be in better position yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let's carry on with Vivian with a follow-up question um, Obviously, we know that world has been in turmoil for the past o over a year with the Russian invasion and before that Corona um, crisis and etc. So how, how does the current geopolitical climate affect the relevance of a circular economy? Well, I think it has had a huge impact, especially in making companies and consumers aware of the dependence we have on uh, raw materials and uh, how important it is that we try to be, at least for some parts, uh, self-sufficient. Um, and uh, in that respect, I also see it as an opportunity, uh, being a believer in the circular economy and considering it to be a necessity. It's not something that we... Uh, like to have, it's a must-have in my opinion. Um, uh, and we need to have a sense of urgency uh, in order to take everyone along in a faster pace. And uh, how unfortunate the situation is, uh, we, you know, we also have to see that it is also um, a small opportunity to convince everyone to really um, uh, be more uh, sensible with our uh, raw materials and put them in a circular loop. Uh, so this is also an opportunity because I saw in the Netherlands we've been um, uh, an advocate of a circular economy uh, for several years now and we've tried to convince companies and consumers uh, by stimulating measures uh, to uh, turn our economy into a circular one. We're doing quite well, but we're not doing as, f uh, as well as we wanted to do. So now we also had to set certain norms uh, and we have to uh, really um, um, uh, push business life uh, through policies uh, to, uh, set the, uh, to lay the bar a bit higher. Uh, so I think that um, when you feel a sense of urgency, uh, the transition will be uh, made faster. So, uh, yeah, for sure it has helped, although I would have liked it to have been in another way. Never miss a good crisis. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Minister Vivian Heinen. Uh, really inspirational. I'd like again to give the floor to Carmen uh, Ine for, for her remark uh, about what is needed to, to transition. Um, so, um, I, I thought I will say what I do, but thank you very much for the opportunity that I have to represent here the voice of the business. Um, we are a European company and um, we, we uh, have a Finnish heritage. 
uh, we, we um, know exactly what it means and what impact the regulations may have on our business because we have a circular, we, we provide circular services for technology. Uh, we also have a joint venture with uh, BMP Paribas, which is a big, um, um, big company in b the biggest leading bank in Europe. Uh, and we understand also the financier perspective uh, from this. So I think, uh, I think we are in, in the middle of that and we live this uh, every day. Um, I think there are many things that can be done and we discussed about legislation. I think what I would need to say, because we speak about uh, the slow penetration of circular economy models, there, is, there are such models. Uh, and, uh, my company is one of these models. We are for 25 years, we provide circular uh, services around technology from the procurement. We track the equipment during the primary lifetime. We take them back. We refurbish in our refurbishing centers and we resell. I want to say that we resell nine of the 10 equipment that comes back in our refurbishing centers and we resell them in Europe. And I think this is very important when we talk about, you know, keeping uh, the, the, the materials here, because one way of keeping the materials here is to prolong the life of, of, our, of our equipment. But to your point on how we need to transition, there is a big discussion now in terms of repairability. Uh, and it's interesting for me to see that we speak about repairability in terms of trends, but if we all remember, our parents used to repair things. Mm. I mean, you would work a lifetime to buy a TV set and you will have it 20 years and you will repair it a couple of times. So it sounds to me like more we are returning to something we once know, knew very well. And I want to give you a, a concrete example because I'd like the youth panel. Um, in uh, uh, yesterday, and they were speaking about meaningful involvement. Um, in our refurbishing center, specifically in one, we have a lot of young ladies. I'm very proud of that, because that's not the natural place where mm -hmm. uh, young ladies should start a career. And one came with an idea, and she said, look, I have this idea. We have all this equipment that we, you know, it's." we can't repair, it really goes to recycling. What if we dismantle it and we use some of the parts to repair the ones that can be repaired? So I said, okay, that's a great idea. Why don't you go ahead and do it? And you know, last year we repaired like, like 35,000 units uh, with 20,000 spare parts that we took from something that otherwise we'd go to recycle. So imagine what we could do if we would have a product module design where you can repair all these things uh, and, and keep them here. So I think, I think this is another way and another thing that can be uh, you know, addressed in the policies, in repairability, in the tax on in how you tax uh, repair goods, yep. and again, how you level uh, play the field, because as long as a new product costs less than repairing a new one, we are not encouraging or incentivizing the circularity. Mm. Amazing, and let's get a hand of applause for that. I really like that concrete example. I think that is really something that we need more of. There's far too often where we talk about the need for more meaningful youth involvement, but I think when you see the concrete examples, this is really something that also inspires more to do the same. Um, but maybe as a follow-up question also to you, then Commissioner Sinkevicius, he also emphasized in his keynote speech the importance of eco-design for sustainable product regulation. Um, to what extent do you think that the forthcoming product design requirement for different product groups play a role in advancing manufacturers to move towards circular products and, and also even services? Yeah, and, and that was the point that I wanted to make uh, earlier on. So I'm glad we start with the product design because a lot of products today are 
last uh, are, are, are designed not to be repaired, mm -hmm. you know, are designed to be used and to be thrown. So definitely this is a very clear focus uh, on that policy and this is where repairability uh, come into play. But we all know that the biggest consumption of raw materials happens in the production of new. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, I'm not a geologist uh, and I don't know too much about that, so I don't want to talk about what I don't know. <laughs> but recently I, 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 uh, um, I was reading that a lot of rare metals have been discovered uh, in Europe, specifically in Finland, Sweden, Norway, in the Baltic area. Uh, and, and it was written there that probably we could be efficient or we could have enough rare metals to, suff to surface for Europe. Of course, if we will, uh, explode them in a sustainable way, in an environmental friendly way. Uh, so it, this is a discussion we need to have with the manufacturers in terms of how you design the product, but there is also some production things we can have in Europe. We all saw during the pandemic that the global supply chain is very fragile. Everything is produced, and, and in terms of technology, which is my industry, it's produced in, in, in uh, China. So I think, I think repairability, circularity, it keeps us preserves uh, the, the rare metal and, and the raw material here, and it helps all your policies that you are putting in place uh, in terms of raw materials. Thank you so much um, and, and really inspiring. So you did so well with, with the other round of yes and no's. Uh, so, so why not give it another go uh, <laughs> with each of you having to, to answer yes or no to this question. The EU's transformation to achieve a green and digital transition requires a lot of critical raw materials, which demand is expected to rise significantly and recycling rates are close to zero. So has enough emphasis been placed to keep critical raw materials in use and in circulation in the EU? What, what an interesting question. So Yogi Katainen, yes or no to that question? Absolutely no. no. <laughs> yes, Vivian, I know. No. Yeah, no. we already see it there. And last but not least, Astrid, no. 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 Again, yeah. unanimous panel. Yeah, All once no. again. <laughs> and we'll have brief um, uh, comments on your, on your answers. Um, Astrid, do you want to start briefly? Why, 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 why is it no? Well, it's, it's, it's a not yet, really. I think we were getting it, and everybody has been saying that it was the COVID crisis, the supply chain disruption, the geopolitical situation. Those are really drivers for us to look at uh, critical raw materials differently. But also, we're now getting serious with the energy transition, and the International Resource Panel has been looking at it for years and has said that a different kind of raw materials are needed for the energy transition to succeed than if you stick to your traditional energy supply. And that hasn't been heard so much, and I think now it is heard, because we just see it, for example, if you want to move to electric mobility, um, was it the supply of lithium will increase 12, uh, the need for lithium will increase by, I think, 12 times by 2030. That's an amazing way so something has to happen. And we heard that and we've just come out with a critical raw material act, which looks at how we can strengthen all stages of supply chain, including and most importantly, I would say from the environment perspective, use what we already have, urban mining, circularity, get the stuff out of the, out of the products we have instead of extracting it and mining it under environmentally questionable conditions. But that has a, a lot of needs that come with it in terms of chemical composition of products and product design again. Yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. great, thank you. And briefly from Jurki, it's a clear no. It, it's clear no because we have not cared. So we have been satisfied for saying that we have to electrify our societies and then close our eyes and accepted the truth that, uh, for instance, cobalt can come from whatever the mine. But now things are changing. It, it's not going to continue like this. Yeah. I think maybe additionally to what has already been said, um, a lot of the uh, waste that we have here now, mm -hmm. uh, which we consider to be waste, has been bought by other countries who consider it to be very valuable natural resources, mm. who can, which can be turned into uh, new um, uh, products. 
Um, and I'm really happy that Europe, and we have done so in the Netherlands as well, has now made uh, a strategy to uh, look at our uh, raw material uh, strategy, especially for the critical uh, raw materials. Uh, but this has been something that um, um, lacked focus uh, on a political level, in my opinion, uh, in a broader sense, eh? so not only on a European level, but also a national level. But we've uh, been uh, repairing this, and it's something to keep in mind <laughs> also for the future. <laughs> Come really briefly. I mean, I it's just very shortly. I think what we need to do is to put circularity more in, con in contact with the environment, because I still have the feeling that we look at circularity and then we look at the environment and we think there are two different things. So I think it's good to put them together. But as I was saying, through our circular model, we reached nine out of uh, uh, ten equipment that we refurbished we resell as used, and we resell them in Europe. Uh, and then we only do this for IT assets. Imagine there will be services, circular services, offered the same way we do for other types of assets. Mm -hmm. You already do a lot of saving by displacing the need for new yeah. with the use of used. But repairing, of course, is very high on the on the ladder. Eh? It's the yeah. highest step. It's way better than recycling. Exactly. And uh, the thing is that you have to repair in order to be able to repair. The product design is where it all starts. So that is something that we all have to yeah. focus on. Yeah. So I completely agree. Let's give a hand of applause for that. Thank you so much. And I will now like to give the floor to Astrid Schumacher for for the last uh, the last speech of today with the short remark. What am I speaking about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, sorry. But we had uh, each person say uh, a few remarks uh, okay. presenting the work that you're doing, yeah. that you're but busy with. Yeah, I, th I think that the key subject here is about how do we bring together nature and the circular economy, put nature at the center of the next commission. And I think for me, there are three things that need to be done. First of all, of course, we now have a global framework, so let's implement it. Mm -hmm. Not just governments, also businesses. There's a lot of in it for business in terms of transparency, accountability, etc. First thing. Secondly, nature and climate needs to go hand in hand. Nature-based solutions for climate are the future. But then thirdly, and maybe even, I won't say most importantly, but importantly, let's make circularity work and let's make circularity work for nature. But first, it has to work. So in the EU, we've I think come out with about 90, 90 legislative, non-legislative acts, action plans, guidance, documents, taxonomy, etc. So all of that we've been throwing out, throwing at the business community, that now needs to be implemented. So let's make that happen so that people actually see the benefits of that. And then let's look a bit beyond where we are and look towards new trends like the bioeconomy, make the bioeconomy work for circularity. There are very important principles that need to be borne in mind. So in order to make sure that bioeconomy is not an economy that suddenly needs to new problems of food security. And then I have many more things that I might want to say, but let's make secondary raw material markets work. They still don't work properly. So it's about information. It's about product dismantleability. It's about chemical composition but it is also about standards that we need, and those standards need to be global. And we have just a negotiation going on for a global circular economy agreement on plastics. That's not going particularly well down there in Paris. The time has been wasted, but that would be really setting a global kind of model that could also then work for, for other materials, and that would be important. And lastly, money, money, money. Mm. So if the global financing institutions could come together and help us let make put circularity also at the sort of center of a paradigm that's uh, surrounding the triple planetary crisis and say resource use or unsustainable resource use is critical here and needs to be addressed and make that their core business. I think that would get us globally a lot further. Thank you so much, Astrid uh, Schumacher. And, and truly interesting what happens in, in Paris. We should all go over and help them then. <laughs> um, they, they may need it. But you already talked a lot about uh, the interlinkages between loss of biodiversity and the climate crisis. And can you maybe elaborate a bit on uh, how this can be considered even more in a European policymaking context? Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. So it would be exactly by doing these three things, looking at what we've agreed to globally, implement it, make circularity work for nature, so bring these conversations together, because I think somebody else was already saying that we've understood circularity and climate go together, and we've integrated climate into the NDCs. Now let's start integrating circularity into the, into the um, 
biodiversity strategies and action plans where it's still missing. So. Lovely. Thank you so much. And I think we should, it's always good that we're reusing the good points. Unfortunately, time is up. Uh, thank you so much to, to all of the dear panelists for sharing your insightful comments and, and remarks. Uh, let's give them a hand of applause while they return to their seats. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. This year's World Circular Economy Forum is nearly there, but there's a couple of more things we want to share with you guys, and actually, Let's carry on with the interactive nature of this forum, and we have a little constructive challenge for you. Mr. Jyrki Katainen, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, and, and thank all the participants, speakers, and also those who are online present. So, um, for companies, holding biodiversity loss is mostly seen as conservation, stricter regulation, and increased reporting responsibilities. The business opportunities and benefits in holding biodiversity loss are not that well recognized. At the same time, CITRAS, EEAs and Ellen MacArthur Foundation's landmark studies show that the circular economy can hold biodiversity loss. CITRA has already created a very popular list of leading Finnish and international circular business solutions that are scalable and inspire the market. Now, there is a clear need to showcase and list circular solutions that can hold biodiversity loss and make successful business at the same time. In the next year's forum, we want to showcase the leading circular solutions in Europe that tackle nature loss to spar European companies to use circular economy as a tool to deliver on nature targets. We have just launched an open call for European companies to apply on the list. The list will be published in WCEF 2024 and more information is available on Citra's website and channels. So, ladies and gentlemen, Dear participants, I really hope that you spread this word all over because we want to see best of the best and we want to call it a big amount of good practices which could be shared with the others. Thank you. Thank you. What an interesting challenge. Thank you so much for sharing that, Joki Katainen. Uh, but we know that you have a bit more exciting news to also share with us. Uh, are you up for doing that? Sure. So, thank you very much for being here this year, but the event will continue also next year, as you probably can guess. I'm proud to announce that the next WCEF will be organized in Brussels next uh, spring, spring 2024. This will be the moment prior to the European Parliament elections and the process of appointing the new European Commission. WCEF in process will offer an opportunity to take stock of achievements and debate about future priorities and actions, not only in Europe, but globally. The forum in process recognizes that acting alone is not an option. We, the WCEF community, need to reconvene and use our influence and expertise and technical and financial resources to support the global transition. CITRA continues to act as a transition facilitator and enabler to plan and deliver the WCEF 2024 and future forums. We have formed strategic alliances with internationally recognized think tank Circular Economy and the International Resource Panel. We will naturally work in close collaboration with the European Commission and continue as a strategic partner for Global Alliance on Circular Economy. The plan is also to intensify collaboration with the United Nations Development Programme, who will help us respond better to developing countries. So, stay tuned for WCF 2024 alerts. I will welcome you all to contribute to the next year's programme, and please welcome to the process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jyrki Katainen. 
So there we go. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, have you had a good time th this year? <laughs> Fantastic. That's what we like to hear. Um, thank you very much for all the co-host partners and forum participants here in Helsinki and online, wherever you are. Thank you very much for your participation all around the world. Conversations, they continue in Accelerator sessions on June 1st and 2nd and inside events organized on 365 days around the world. Obviously, the collaboration continues. And please remember to answer the forum questionnaire uh, so that we can keep learning and improve for the next time. The survey will be sent out over email, so it should be easy to find it. And it's been, it's been our absolute pleasure to work as your moderators. Thank you very much from us. And, um, we wish you a very good journey back home, wherever that is, and hope to see you soon again. And obviously, the work on circular economy has only begun, so the work continues. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone. Thank you.